Stuxnet is a kind of a computer virus, but it's not a typical computer virus. Um, and it was made uh, allegedly by Israeli and perhaps uh, U.S. intelligence to go and seek out and infiltrate the Iranian uh, uranium enrichment plants. And uh, it's kind of the Jason Bourne of viruses, you know. It's, it's, it's like nothing, it's like no computer virus you've ever heard of. It, it uses the, the kind of artificial intelligence programming techniques that you would use, say, in a Mars rover that you're going to send on, on a mission of many years with, 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 that, with no possibility of, uh, of intervening or controlling or anything at that time. And, uh, and this virus went behind the scenes, went into these uh, enrichment facilities, damaged the equipment in a way that it happened right under the nose of Iranian engineers, and they didn't realize it was happening. When they discovered it, it was too late. The equipment had already been destroyed. Well, so Stuxnet is out there, right? Stuxnet, Stuxnet was launched. It was, a, it was a military strike, really, and it, it had succeeded. But it's out there now, and everyone has copies of it. Everyone is reverse engineering it. Uh, when I say everyone, I mean the, the Iranians, the Chinese, the Russians, who, whoever. Um, so what happens if, and this is hypothetical, what happens if someone uh, makes a boomerang stu Stuxnet and they decide to target it at, let's say, the U.S. power grid? And the, the uh, generators that, that run our power grid, there are really very few of them. There are only a few. You know, they're in the hundreds, not, not the thousands. And um, they're very similar in terms of how they work to uh, the uranium uh, fuel centrifuges. So you don't really need to make many changes to modify Stuxnet to, to work in the power grid. Now, if, if you had a Stuxnet-like infection in the U.S. power grid, and it, caused, it could cause physical damage simultaneously throughout all the generators, or say many of the generators in the United States. Now these generators would shut down, right? They would not only shut down, they would be destroyed, they would be physically destroyed, so that you couldn't fix them, you would need to replace them. So now imagine you have the United States, and say you have 300 generators out throughout the United States. You've got three quarters of the country with no power at all, and with no prospect of getting power for many, many months because that's how long it's going to take to get to, to manufacture new generators. You just there's only so much uh, manufacturing capacity for new generators. So what you have is you have a, a, a crisis of humanitarian and economic disaster proportions. It's, a, it's an apocalypse. I mean, you've got, you, people are dying because they can't get food, they can't get water, they're, they're, they, they can't get heat. And uh, uh, you know the roads aren't working because there's no electricity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can just you can just imagine how bad it would be. It would be on the order of a nuclear holocaust. The, the humanitarian and economic damage. It's just yeah. they're just you know when you computer viruses you don't know you can't recognize a computer virus that you've never seen. You can only recognize ones that you know are there. That's what uh, all the security software does is semantic and all that stuff. And so uh, if there's something really, truly novel, there's no way to tell what it is. So it's very hard to say, well, if we just do this, or if we just load up your virus software, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to do something about it. You, you can't. But what you can do is you just have to be incredibly vigilant, and then you, and you have to plan for, for, these, uh, for, for what happens if something goes wrong and try, and try to respond. And uh, you, you, know, you work like intelligence does, where you know who's out there and who's doing what, and you just keep a watchful eye out. It's a scary world. You know, there's no there's no fortress you can build to hide behind. Yoshikawa Oka is a, a, a was a Japanese young Japanese uh, uh, a researcher uh, in 1983 when he came to the United States and just so happened to walk into the middle of this huge uh, outbreak of bird flu among uh, poultry farms in the north in Pennsylvania um, and. Uh, it was, it was a huge deal. In order to stop this outbreak, they had to kill 17 million birds, and it was a huge military-style operation. But Kawaoka's role here was to test the virus, and he would, he, would, he would infect chickens in his laboratory, and he would cut them open afterwards. And he, what he saw was very alarming. He saw that this virus not just, didn't just kill chickens by infecting their, their digestive system or their lungs. They, they, they infected every organ in their body. They consumed, this virus consumed every organ in the chicken's body. And it was much like what Ebola does to humans. 
Now, if you think about this, if you think about a possibility of a, of a virus that can spread as easily as influenza, but that does what Ebola does, that is the, that is the doomsday virus. So ever since then, uh, Kawaoka has studied um, influenza with the idea, uh, among other things, of, of trying to figure out what exactly is it that makes it so deadly to humans and so transmissible. With the idea that if we understand this disease, understand how the virus works, perhaps we can do something to head off what could be a really scary pandemic. Um, now, 20, 20 some, 25 years later, Kawaoka comes out with a uh, research paper, this is just last year, where he has developed a, he has taken the 2009 pandemic virus, uh, which spread like wildfire. Every, it went around the globe before uh, the, the public health officials even got wind of it. Fortunately, it was mild. He crossed that with one of these deadly bird flu viruses, and he found that this virus could spread among humans. He tested it among animals. He didn't test it among humans. But it could, it could theoretically spread among humans. So this tells us that, that it is possible that nature or a, bi a bioterrorist could produce an influenza virus that spreads among humans that is potentially lethal. And when I say lethal, bird flu, the bird flu that he was playing with uh, in the wild kills 60% of all the people who, who are infected. Now, I'm not saying that Kawaoka has made the doomsday virus. His virus is not a doomsday virus, but, it, but the work shows you how very close we are to a doomsday virus. The first thing that, that we need to do is understand what the nature of our problems are. And that's why I wrote the book, because the book it tries to bring out you know, the, the really the most salient threats um, in a way that people can understand. Um, I, I think that it, another thing is it's really important to, to realize that we can't, we can't live behind a, a, a fortress. We can't hide under the bed and hope that these things go away or, or, or make them go away by banning uh, GMO foods or something like that or some other kind of scary technology. I mean, these are all problems that are products of our success and products of our technology. And so technology has been very helpful for us because it's allowed us to grow to 7 billion people on this planet. So to dismiss technology out of the hand as a solution would be, would be foolish. So I think, we need to, I think we need to realize that the world is a very dangerous place. We are at a very dangerous point in our development. And we need to, we need to have a very clear head and make the right decisions because we've got a lot riding on it.